this is Jen from A Grateful Studio and I have another wonderful tutorial ahead for you guys right here. Uh, if you love rainbows and you love collar necklaces, this is something that's going to be super cute. I made one for myself in black and I get a lot of uh, compliments on it. So uh, first I want to show you what tools we're going to need for this. Some of these are optional and some of them uh, you kind of need if you want to do this. Um, I really think that this right here is a must. You got to get yourself a set of uh, collar cutters. Uh, and the link to these is in my description. You totally want to check this, uh, this site out because uh, it's where I get most all my cutters from. And uh, I just love FTH supplies and uh, Rhonda is just uh, really fabulous with her cutters. Uh, you can also get this at the same place again in my description. You can check that out for the link to that uh, This is optional for this tutorial. You can cut your own paint drips out uh, but um, Sometimes it's really hard to get a nice uh, Flat edge when you're cutting your own paint drips out and sometimes you have you know just the edging is not even and so I just really enjoy using this cutter because it makes it really simple and then I'm going to be needing my uh, ruler and the ruler is really just for you to make sure that you cut enough uh, that you have enough rainbow width uh, in order to use your rainbow cutter I will also be using my tissue blade this very sharp tissue blade uh, and a roller an acrylic roller I'm using uh, white clay and I'll go into this in a second but I'm also using these colors now it's it's a rainbow that we're going to be creating and I like mixing my rainbow in this uh, uh, in these colors with the green and the blue being on opposite ends uh, it's just something that I prefer uh, I really enjoy the look of uh, the edging. Actually, you know, I think this is the, yeah, this is actually the way I put most of my uh, rainbows. Uh, I know it's not the actual proper order that you typically see a rainbow, but I don't go by typical anything. So uh, another thing that you are going to want to have, uh, and I highly recommend this, is just getting a plate that has a slight curve. Uh, I buy my plates from Mainstays, and uh, once I use them for clay, I just keep using them for clay. I don't eat on them, uh, but I'm going to be baking my collar on this plate. So uh, you definitely want something uh, that doesn't have a big curve, uh, but just a slight curve. Let me turn this this way so you guys can see that, you know, the curve isn't, um, it's not extravagant on this. It's very subtle, so that's why I particularly like this plate today uh, and uh, let's see so to go into the clay now you are going to need white now you can use black you can use white you can use whatever you want for the base of your collar uh, today I'm going to be using um, trying out Fimo uh, leather along with the paint rainbow this is all Primo now I have baked um, Primo and Fimo together before and I have gotten wonderful results. Now Fimo you're supposed to bake at 265 for 30 minutes and then Primo you're supposed to bake at 275 uh, for 30 minutes depending on the thickness. So what I usually do is I still bake it at 275 for 45 minutes. And uh, so far, I have not had any problems with my Fimo uh, clay uh, having any issues. In fact, I really, really love Fimo clay. It's um, this is the leather clay, by the way. I'm I'm not particularly a big user of Fimo's regular clay, but I love their leather clay because this stuff. You, if you want to make bracelets or something that's really got want some flex to it or some style to it and you don't want to use a say you don't want to use a texture sheet uh, Fimo is fabulous because it already has texture almost like fibrous textures inside the clay so this stuff is wonderful uh, I will recommend that when you first get your block of clay if it's not um, you know extremely like if you can't push your finger into it it's going to be a little hard to uh, mix it through so what you're going to want to do is uh, put this in a warm spot 
like in your pocket next to your body so that you get some body heat off of this so that you can uh, warm it up a little bit. You can also put it in your hands for a few minutes and warm it up that way. Uh, but anyway, the base of my collar is going to be Fimo leather. And when I reduce this, I put it in my pasta machine. That is another tool, of course, that we're going to need. Uh, if you do not have a pasta machine, you can go to the same place that these collars, uh, this collar uh, cutter set and this, rain, uh, this um, paint drip uh, edge cutter uh, and get yourself some... Um, their edge measure, oh God, what, what was the name she used? Uh, they're the same width as um, a pasta machine. So if you don't have a pasta machine, you can get uh, uh, brackets that go on the side and they have their sizes on them. And you can use those at the same uh, thicknesses that I'm using on my pasta machine. So if you don't wanna invest in a pasta machine, definitely invest in those and you'll be able to uh, do this without a pasta machine. So I have my roller here. I'm not really gonna be using this for too much other than helping this get conditioned. I wanna flatten this out before I put it in my pasta machine. And when I do put it in my pasta machine, I start at the very thickest level, which is a zero, and I'm using an Atlas 150 uh, Marcato pasta machine. And I put it through a good five times at its thickest level as I'm folding it in half and, and conditioning it, getting it workable. And then I go and I actually reduce my, um, my pasta machine with this stuff in it. And I reduce it all the way down as far as I can go without it being torn up. The reason I do that is because you'll find that um, Fimo can either be your best friend or the most frustration. There is a slight learning curve to using Fimo. And if you don't want to use Fimo for the base of your collar, you do not have to. Use Primo, you can use uh, Fimo, you can use, uh, let's see, uh, Cosclay, you can use um, Kato. Kato is another one that I really enjoy using when I can get a hold of the colors that I want. So again, I'm just using the Fimo leather in particularly because I just really love the way that this stuff feels and um, working with it. So I'm going to put this in my pasta machine at a thickness of zero, which is the thickest setting. And this is what it looks like first. And apparently I have a cat hair in my pasta machine. I already have fibers in the clay kitty cats. I do not need help with more hair. Okay. So now I'm just going to fold this over. And you know your clay is fresh when you can fold it over and you don't get a crack right down the side. So the less cracks you get when you bend your clay over, whether it's Fimo, Kato, uh, any of them, uh, you'll notice that if it's cracking down that you probably have some more conditioning to do. And that's two folding it over three times folding it over now look at this this is so uneven now this is the one issue that I have with Fimo leather clay but it's not that big of an issue if you know what to do so this is why I condition it all the way down to the thinnest setting that I can because it helps get rid of all this um, it doesn't get, totally get rid of it but it reduces all this breakage and it really gets those uh, fibers and everything mixed together really well so that they start binding again. So I'm gonna feed it through my pasta machine like, let's see, I'll probably do it like this. I'll put it through my pasta machine like this and I'm trying to bring this part over so that it's a square again so that I can cut an even, get an even sheet so that I can cut my collar out. See, it's starting to straighten up a little bit. And it went towards this way instead of this way, but that's okay. So now I'm gonna reduce my pasta machine thickness 
down to a two, and I'm going to start putting it through here a few times again. That's one, and that's two, and that's three. See, now it's starting, you notice here where it's the edges are starting to get a little more clean. Four. And gotta line these up right so I can get a nice good square. Dream on, because sometimes it'll just still do this. It'll still give you that little tail, femo tail. <laughs> but I'm going to fold this up again, and now I'm going to reduce my pasta machine down to four thickness. And if you're doing this by hand, you really got to get thin. You want to get these fibers really mixed in well, and that's when I I find that I get the 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 whole block is nice and conditioned and usable. Okay, so now do it a couple more times. And there's the femo tail getting stubbier, so, so it is getting shorter. And now I'm going to re reduce my pasta machine down to a thickness of six. And some of you may worry that once you get down to a thickness of six, sometimes Primo gives me a little bit of trouble sometimes when I'm trying to make it really ultra thin because it can get sticky. And I've noticed this stuff doesn't give... Um, it can be sticky sometimes, but most of the time, if you mix it up really well, the stickiness kind of goes away, and it really does feel like a like a leather, like a fresh leather. So I really, really enjoy this. I am now on a thickness of eight, which is like uber, uber thin for my pasta machine. And I have a nice long sheet. Now... You'll notice if you if you have this right here and it won't go away, all you have to do to get that to go away is start getting your pasta machine uh, back, going back up in thickness. So once it goes back up in thickness, you'll notice these little fibers start getting absorbed again back into the clay and that it doesn't stick out like that. And you'll notice sometimes there's still that, that debris that sticks above the clay, but that is okay. Now I'm going to go up in thickness to a thickness of four. And you'll notice that that debris is totally gone now. It's all absorbed. There's nothing sticking above like it's um, been shaved or something uh, like it did before. But you'll notice that these cracks can come back. That does not mean that it's not conditioned. That just means that you're going to have to feed it through the pasta machine. Um, and sometimes putting brackets or something on the pasta machine, like uh, putting this against the edge of your pasta machine, uh, will force this to fold in on itself and kind of give you a nice cleaner line. Okay, now this is a thickness of four on my pasta machine, and like I said, there is the femo tail. It's a stubby tail. This is more like a tail that's folded around the puppy. But anyway, I'm going to put this right here. Now, I will warn you, if you have any debris in your pasta machine from your other clays, and it gets into the femo, you, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to cut that out before you start really conditioning it because all it does is make it, um, it doesn't absorb into the clay like you want it to. 
Uh, it just uh, it takes forever to get that little tiny bit of clay to disperse in the in the in the in the clay itself. So if you see some debris, go ahead and cut that out as soon as you see it. Clean your pasta machine before you put this through too, because uh, unlike you know if I put this yellow through my pasta machine and I pick up a little bit of another color, it's not going to hurt it, but I will stop and clean my pasta machine. Now, I um, this is not clay that you see in the edge that I haven't cleaned off. This is actually Sharpie marker because uh, when I'm trying to design something, sometimes I sit at my bed in the evening time and I draw ideas. And so one day I just started outlining these in my book and uh, then I can color them in any design I want that I can think of that I want to do and see if that's something I really want to do. So just uh, now you're just going to take a cut at a thickness of four, work your cutters in and make sure that it is fully cut because uh, this Fimo clay has so much fiber in it that sometimes it's hard for cutters to follow through all the way. I do know that these cutters that I get from FTH Supplies, uh, Rhonda has changed her edge edging and it has really helped with getting things to cut nice and clean, just like we all like, or we all hope for. Okay, so now, See, it didn't cut completely through. And that's just because there's a little bit of debris, just kind of, or not debris, that's the wrong word, uh, fiber in the clay. And sometimes it just doesn't want to separate if it's not something really hitting that tile. Okay, there's a little bit right here too. I always think that I'm sliding on the tile, but okay. So now I have my collar pieces. I'm going to remove them from the tile so that I can straighten them out here so you guys can see. From here, there's a little edging sometimes, particularly with Fimo clay, the leather clay that is. So I just pet that down and I turn it over and I pet that down and it just kind of, this is what I really like about this clay too, is I'm, any debris that I'm finding, it just absorbs right back into it without much fuss, which, and I don't have to worry about fingerprints because it's got this, this texture. I don't know how well you guys can see that. See that? Look at the texture already. It's awesome. And that edging, I just gently on rubbing my finger on the edge there until, and then I'll just turn it over just to make sure I go in both directions. And it just absorbs it right in. Sometimes you'll get these little, little fibers that'll come off on your fingers too. That's okay, pull those off, don't try to pat those back in. Sometimes having a paper towel or a baby wipe around just to wipe your fingers as you go when you're playing anyway is a good idea. And now I'm gonna do the same thing. Oop, sorry guys, didn't realize you were out of focus. Okay, so these little balls of debris, just take those off and just pat around the side or rub the edges and that will help this absorb that that edging if you don't like what, how it looks. And sometimes I'll lay it on the other side, clean up my mess here, and run my finger along the edges of the side that was against the glass just because um, Fimo, whatever edges you give it, if it's not like a rounded edge, it will be stiff. You'll probably have to sand it. But if you do it now, if you rub this down now, it really stops a lot of that to where you don't have to do that. Because Fimo can be a bit stiff at times. And that may be because I'm cooking it at a higher heat that it's a little more stiff than you want it to be. But I did not mind how it feels. 
Okay. So now those are exactly how I want them to be. I'm going to stick them over here in the top corner out of the way. And now what I'm going to do is make my rainbow. And this is the mixture that I use. And like I said, you can do your rainbow exactly how you guys want to do it. I'm going to put all my little balls. And these are literally just that much. Just uh, probably, I'm going to say dime to nickel size. There's not much. I literally just take a, a pinch off of a block of clay. And like I said, this is Primo. Um, I'm not sure how much white I'm going to use, whether I'm going to use all of this two cuts uh, or if I'm going to just use half of this. I do want a pastel rainbow, so I don't know how much white I'm going to, to need yet. It just depends on how much, how dark you want your rainbow. Now, if you just want your rainbow this dark, like you don't want to lighten this up at all, I highly recommend going ahead and uh, doing two of these, two sizes of each of these, so that you have more to work with. Uh, this is all I need because I'm making a pastel rainbow. So if you want your rainbow to be a dark rainbow, then by all means. Just add more color of the same colors, of course. So I'm going to take my white and put it through my pasta machine at its thickest setting, which is a zero. Now, I've measured my collar to be from this length to this length just about five inches. So what I'm going to need is I'm going to need five inches of rainbow. So as I reduce this, I'm gonna let my rainbow stretch out, just so you guys are aware. So now I'm going to take my colors and stamp them down. And I'm just gonna put them right on here. And now I'm just going to roll these in a little bit more to make it easier to go through my pasta machine. So I'm just going to put it in just like that at the thickest setting and I'm going to start mixing my rainbow. That's the first run. And that's what it looks like twice through. So now I'm going to start putting this through a whole bunch of times without showing you guys, but I will count how many times I'm going. This will be three, four, and as you're doing this, you guys, you're going to want to try and keep your, your colors some, somewhat lined up with each other for right now. They'll naturally, the more you mix it, they'll naturally uh, get to where they're the size that you want. Now, you're also, if you're using a pasta machine, your pasta machine is five and a half inches. So what you're gonna wanna do is keep an eye as your, uh, your piece is extending that you don't wanna go past that five inch level because you want all of the colors to be involved in your collar. All right, so this is 10. Uh, and I'm finding that the colors are pretty much too too dark for my liking, so I will go ahead and use some more white. I'll run this through my pasta machine. And I don't know if I want all of this or half this, so I'm going to go ahead and again do an experiment and do half of this to see if that's going to be a light enough for my liking. Okay, so my green isn't quite catching up like I want it to, and I love the colors. I put a tiny strip of blue to try and darken this a little bit because it was light to begin with, uh, but uh, otherwise I'm just going to add a little bit of this, this green over here and uh, maybe a little bit more blue so that it mixes in with the purple so that I can get this side a little more straight the way I want it. Uh, it's at the... Uh, I've been watching the length of it, and uh, it's just under five inches, which is exactly where I want it to be, to be able to drape over my collar. 
So I will come back to you after I put a touch more blue here, dark blue, and a little bit of, uh, this is a Sculpey Souffle that I'm using mixed with uh, Primo Sculpey. Okay, so this is around 30 revolutions, so it's just got a little while longer to go. Okay, here it is. I have put this thing through the pasta machine probably a good 40 to 45 times. Uh, I dare say maybe even 50. Um, the more you put it through the pasta machine, the more the colors will blend. Sometimes the colors will kind of dull uh, because they're really getting mixed in with the other colors. So if it gets too dull in one specific area, you can see how the blue was really absorbed by the purple and the green. Um, then you can add uh, a little bit more blue and white as you're putting it through the pasta machine and that will vibrant make it vibrant again. Um, so right now what I have is a sheet that is... Something's in my way over here. Okay. This is just under five inches and uh, same in in the middle here. So really what you need is you need just a thickness um, or a width when you cut uh, that and you're going to want to decide just how far you want your paint drip to be. So uh, but you're not going to cut off uh, your rainbow until you're sure. Okay so don't worry about that. This, this should be the easy way to do this. I forgot to tell you that this is actually a thickness of three on my pasta machine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this completely in half. You will have some left over and you can actually make earrings with that to match this. So now what you should have is two pieces. Now what you're going to want to make sure you do and again, this is really up to you whether you want to do it this way or not. Is you want to see, do you want your collar, both your collars to match with the colors like this? Or do you want the colors to just start over again and uh, go up this way? Personally, I think it's most uh, vivid and bright uh, going like this. So this is the way that I'm going to, to do this. So what you're going to do is you're going to make your, your rainbow drips, but you're going to make your cuts down at the bottom of your clay here. You want to do it at the bottom, uh, as far down as you can get. And uh, the reason being is you just don't know how thick you want this on here yet. So you're going to be cutting the other side flat. And also, I want this to actually go around the leather clay on the top. So I want it to be covering the top as well and falling kind of over the collar. So that's my motivation for how I want mine to look. So I'm going to go right to the edge where this starts and I'm going to go all the way and I'm matching this down here so that it, you know, it goes right to where I can't go anymore. And I'm just going to give this a nice good press all the way down it. And I always give a little wiggle because I wiggle while I work. And I'm going to wiggle it slightly in the middle. I'm just making sure when I wiggle that it's touching the tile because that's how it, it really, that's how I know it's made a nice good cut. And that should be easier with uh, Primo than it is with the Fimo, just simply because there's fiber in here. So now I'm gonna go over and I'm gonna continue this cut over here and do the rest of the drip. Okay, right there. And I can round that off, that little edge, but it's still better than me trying to do this with an X-Acto knife because I've done it with an X-Acto knife. It's not easy to keep your X-Acto knife straight up in the air to make sure that uh, your piece is, is even all the way through. So now I'm gonna do the same thing over here 
and I don't need a mirror drip I just need it to continue over here and again I'm going to go to the bottom and match that now you might be saying well why didn't I just cut this in a nice strip and then cut this in half and use the opposites uh, you know this bottom piece and that's just because I wanted to um, I like to line up the colors first before I do it so that to make sure that they're matching perfectly I like to do it this way you can do it the other way to where you have this in one long block and you just um, use this to cut it in half and that way you have the two pieces if that makes sense to you totally do it I'm just gonna do it this way because everybody has their ways that they like to do things and this is just mine so again, I'm making sure that I'm pushing against the tile and I'm giving a slight wiggle, just a slight, and I'm gonna do that in the middle too. And on the, all the pieces, I wanna make sure that it's touching the tile so that I know I have a nice clean cut. And then I pull my, oop, I picked up some clay from my other cut. Didn't realize that was there. And look how, how nice this edging is. So now I'm going to again continue over here and finish this edge up. Just a little stuck so that sometimes they need a little coaxing. Now there is a product that you can get that actually stops the clay from sticking and that edge is okay there we go and I can fix those and redo this to my liking. Now I'm going to pull this away, and that, that product that I'm telling you about that helps the clay not stick is called uh, Easy Slip, and uh, you, it's uh, sold the same place that you get these cutters, and you just spritz it on, and then you make your cut. Uh, well, you spritz it on, and then you just kind of wipe it off a little bit, um, and then you make your cut, and it usually, every single time I've used it, um, it's been fabulous. So oh, I have to buy some more. So if you don't have any of that, you can also use uh, some cornstarch. I don't like to use cornstarch too often, especially on the front of my piece. I just don't want it to stick too much to the clay. So I'm gonna put these pieces up here because those can be earrings. Oh. Now that I have my flipping wicked paint drips, I'm going to very carefully remove these from the tile. Okay. All right, let me clean off my tile right there. And I'm gonna pull my, this would be, this is going to hang on my the left side of the body. So this is my left collar. And so what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna see exactly how you want this to go on here. And this is going to take a little bit of finagling. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to start bending this a little bit. And let me give you a better angle of what I'm doing here. So there's a little bubble right there, right? If you take your clay and put it where you want it on your Fimo, right? So this is kind of how I want it to hang. Except, um, let's see here, I'm probably going to want all these droplets to just kind of hang off here. This one I might trim later. So this is how it looks. So I have this little bubble here. Now if you put this on your Fimo clay, what you want to do is you just want to pet this on here. Okay. So once you get everything to where you like it positioned on your collar, you're going to push on this bubble right on the edge of where the collar is because you'll be able to tell now that you've kind of patted everything down. You can see where your collar edging and I put it just past this and of course the green is way back over here so there's not going to be much green on this one. So. This bubble, you can just start pushing gently. 
real gently and push the bubble into itself, kind of like a, I don't know how to describe that. I'm just, just squeezing it together. I'm not trying to touch these two sides together, these two. I'm just trying to push this down enough and keep the purple in place to where I can see perfectly the edge here of my collar. Because now I'm going to take my tissue blade and I'm going to cut that. Right. Now I'm not going to cut it right next to the, the collar. What I want to do is I'm going to cut right next to that bubble where the purple ends, right where my finger is, because that's plenty of space. It's like a, almost a full pinky worth of space between my, the edge of my collar and that bump right there. So I know that's where it is, and I can see right where my edging is here. And if you can't, do not cut it yet. You want to see the edges, all the edges, so that you don't accidentally cut your collar. So once you get that edge to right where you know it is and you just make your cut, make sure you got through to the tile and peel this off. And there's no, no white on here, so that means I totally missed my collar, which is what I was aiming. What, that was my motive, not to touch the, not to get the collar. Now I'm going to cut my edge over here, and again, I'm cutting past the edge because I want this drip to wrap around my collar, and I'm going to cut a little bit more off right over here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my finger and I'm just going to start petting this down the edge very gently. And I'm going to round this edge right here. And I'm going to push that down to the tile and make sure that it sticks to the collar, the edge of it. Because like I said, I want the paint to be looking like it's literally coming, dripping over the edge of my collar. And I'm going to tuck this corner, this green corner, I'm just going to tuck it in. And I'm just smoothing that off. My tissue blade. I'm going to separate this from the tile. And now I'm going to flip this over so that I can see my edge. And if you want your rainbow to come in closer, you can go ahead and cut that off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lay this down and I'm just going to smooth it just a little bit more. And I'm going to run my fingers along the femo. Okay, so I'm going to just start softening the corners and petting the edges just to make sure that I like that everything's nice and smoothed out so that I don't have to go in later. Since they're not smooth, I'm going to take a knitting needle and just lightly go around it the areas that I don't think are smoothed off. And I don't mind uh, making some of these drops flat with my finger, so I'm actually going to push down on these droplets to kind of have them looking more like they're pooling, like they're like real paint would. And this one right here, I'm going to just pinch off the edge of this and round it off with my fingers, just slowly, until the edges look nice again. All right, 
right, so I put everything into place just like I did on the other one. Uh, figure out exactly, I think I want my, my green to come down because there's a little bit of a flaw in the corner, but it's just a flaw with how it looks, not with the functionality of the collar. So now that I have this in where I want it, like I did with the other, I'm going to start patting down everything. I can have the blue actually drip that way too. I did not think of that. I probably should have done that with the other one too. So if you want it to make it look like real drips, I guess you could angle the drips towards the middle because that's kind of how it's going to hang. But I'm just trying to salvage this blue piece here and I don't want to have to cut it off. Okay, so I'm again, I'm just gonna start patting everything down so that I can see all the edges making sure everything's adhered so nothing moves around. And again, I'm going over the edges on both sides. And then I'm gonna push with my fingers and that hood is still there. And I'm gonna push that down so that I can really see this edge of this collar here because I don't wanna cut into that. So just take your time with this. Don't rush it. Now that I can see that, again, I'm going to cut in this top bubble area right here down because I want that extra edge just like I did on the other collar, the other side. Okay, take that piece and put it over there. I'm gonna cut off this edge. And I'm going to neaten up this one right here. Oop. And again, I'm just going to start patting this down and making sure that this goes right around that edge. Now, I'm noticing that there is way, way, way more um, paint than collar. But what I really want to do is I, I want this much paint. And I don't, it needs to match the other. So what I'm saying is the width of the paint falling over, you want that to match. So what I would do is I would leave that on there just so that it matches better. Because if I cut that extra piece off, that's going to actually make it look odd because it'll be shorter than this side and you want them to be even. So for some reason, when I put this side on, it didn't react the same way. Maybe because when I pulled the cutter off, it extended these droplets a little bit, but that is okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to push this back down towards the tile and run my finger along the top just so that I can get this still curved look, but I don't want it to look like there's no collar behind it like there is here. See how the, let me clean this up so I don't pick up some extra clay here. So this is very um, small area and this is kind of a larger area and I put them both on to where the paint touches the edges. Maybe I could have done a little more here but it still looks good. So this they both look the same but the backs are a little slightly different. That is okay. If you don't like the way that backing looks, I guarantee you I have sold these before and customers do not care. They care simply about the front, but if you have to have that, that really finished look, you can go back and add a backing on by simply putting this over the top of some, uh, some Fimo clay in a thinner piece and put that backing on there and that'll give you a finished back anyway. And you can clean up any edging too that um, isn't to your liking. This is when you would do it so that you don't have to worry about sanding. You can still buff the, uh, the paint so that it shines if you want to. But I wouldn't recommend sanding because if you didn't um, 
blend your rainbow really, really, really well, sometimes you will uncover another color mixture and it won't be the same. And you'll have that like a, if I were to sand it right here, orange might come through in the yellow area or uh, pink might come through in this area or green might come through in this area. So um, sanding maybe not so much on the, the, the rainbow, but you can buff it to make sure that it's nice and shiny. And what I would probably use myself, and not that it needs it, but this is a wax polish that I like to use and it gives a nice shine. So that's why I like to use that. I prefer putting my holes in before I bake as opposed to after, in particularly with Fimo. I don't like having to drill into Fimo. So I'm going to put these on my tile. Now you'll notice that my tile is not exactly circular enough like this uh, piece is, but that is okay. So I'm going to put this right here because the way it's going to go on you anyway, it's going to hang like this. So this is how we're going to be putting our findings in. And once our findings are on there, this is how it's going to hang. So it does not matter that this is actually going to be at that angle. But if you happen to have a plate that is um, a little more smooth, uh, use that one because that is going to be fabulous for you. Oh, I almost... Okay, I'm going to put that... What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add uh, leather designs in this. So I'm going to put what you would call rivets into this. So I'm going to put a circle there. Whoop. And another here. And since that's like that over there, the paint's kind of in the way, I'm going to do the same thing over here. So I'm going to be putting a hole right here and I'm putting, I'm making sure this is in the middle of the leather and it is right there in the middle. And I want to make sure that this is a nice wide hold. So I'm going to make sure that my toothpick goes all the way to the middle of the toothpick and then I wiggle it to pull it out. And then again, on the other side, I'm going to do the same thing. That way I have a nice large space for that. And since over here the paint is in the way, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm still going to put the hole in the middle of the Fimo leather. All the way to the middle of the toothpick. And there we go. And sometimes there's a little bit of that clay sticking up. So just tap on that a little bit and then run your toothpick through it one more time. And that should flatten it to where it's not going to bother anything. Okay, so now I'm going to start with my little holes again. My little leather holes. What I don't even know what to call them. Rivet spaces? I don't know. Okay, so I put one right here and then right here. And right here. 
Now, the good thing about these is since I've already started the hole, if I want to, I can add um, little tassels onto this if I really want to. Which, oh my god, that would look super cute to have some little white tassels. Or paint drops. You can do paint drops to hang off of this. And since the holes are already there, it makes it a whole lot easier to drill. Okay. Turn this around here. And so we need a spot to connect this. Now, the best place to connect this would be towards the top so that it hangs correctly. And uh, you can put something in the middle to join this. Um, and I'll show you that coming up here after this is baked. I will show you what exactly I use to fasten all this together. Open this and put a nice large hole just like you did for over here. And you kind of want to go into the corner in this area, but you don't want to go too close to the edge. There's going to be a lot of movement with this particular area. So you want to make sure that your hole and whatever you use to with this can support that movement. So you want that nice, that hole nice and large to allow for that movement and then I'm going to make sure that this lines up perfectly with the other one. I'm going to turn this over just so I can see what I'm doing here and poke this back through the other's way. And work my toothpick all the way through very slowly, don't want to tug at it. And you see how there's that edge that's uh, up a little bit? And just pat that down. See, absorbs right back into it. And then you just stick your toothpick in there one more time to open the hole back up. And then it's nice and clean. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this off to the side. And I have clay left over. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this here and I'm going to attempt to line these up. Let's see here and put them through my pasta machine again. And these earrings really don't take anything uh, special to make other than uh, you just need a um, knitting needle. I actually found some knitting needles at the Dollar Tree. So you can do a uh, kind of a thick knitting needle or a thin knitting needle. I prefer the thicker ones for this particular earring. And it's super easy. Once I get the this uh, blend right back on track to where it was, I'm going to be making a pair of spiral earrings to match my collar necklace and it really does kind of give a really cute look. Spiral earrings, really, I love them because they can match just about anything. You just take the scrap clay and then you just roll with it. Whatever you got left over, you can make a pair of earrings that go right with it like they were meant to be from the beginning, but in reality, maybe it was just uh, you forgot what you wanted to do with the rest of your your piece, your uh, scrap. So now that I have mixed these together and it's definitely more of a noticeable, um, and that's because I went ahead and added a pinch of purple here to reignite that purple, and my uh, pink was starting to fade into my orange way too much so I added a little pink and a little uh, orange to just liven those colors back up uh, so now I have this set out to a thickness of four on my pasta machine um, 
typically I can go all the way down to a thickness of five on this, but this, um, this clay is super sticky right now because I've been working with it so much. So instead of forcing it to go down to a thickness of five and hoping that it doesn't stick too much, I'm just gonna go ahead and leave it at a four. It, it really doesn't matter what the length of this is, honestly, whether you want it short or long is up to you. Um, I went ahead and shrunk this down to, this is about one, two, three, four, maybe about four or five, five centimeters short of uh, four inches. So it's shorter than the five inches, or almost five inches that I had up here for the collar. And like I said, the size of this will just depend on how long you want your spirals to be. And I'm going to cut this little uh, non-even edge off right here. Yeah, this clay is super sticky. Super sticky. Okay, so now I'm just going to cut strips. And your strips can be thick, they can be thin. I never do thick, I always do thin, which is typically, let's see, uh, how thick? And do I do mine? Probably one, two, three, four. Between four and five centimeters is how uh, wide I typically do my spirals. And I always eyeball it because I'm just down like that. And now I have a pair of earrings right there. Now I have two pairs of earrings. And now I have a pair of earrings to carry around in my purse. So the next time somebody compliments me on the jewelry I'm wearing, they're gonna get those. And here's another pair of earrings. Look how much you can get. Think about, this is just scrap from what I used earlier. All in all, the entire amount of clay that I've used for this entire project is probably about, I want to say two blocks, maybe two and a quarter. The white clay is probably the most that you will use. And that's just to lighten up the rainbow or to use that as a base. And if you don't want to use it as a base, uh, you can use black. Uh, the first collars that I made with the rainbow drips, I made in black. And that's the one I usually wear. So I have one pair, two, three, four, five pairs of earrings. And then if I cut them really thin, if I cut this edging off right here, I can see where the middle is on this one. And let's see. That more in the middle. Mika. My cat's knocking stuff over. Okay, so now you see how the edges is, you know, I should have cut this before I even started. Let me just clean that up. It wasn't, it was so not messy for once that I, uh, I just forgot. Okay, so now that I have my strips cut, all I have to do, peel them up. And I'm going to start with these ones because they're more even than that one. I'm going to peel this up very gently because I don't want to stretch my yellow. Like I said, this clay is very, very fresh. So I start with whichever one that I want. Let's see. If I want the yellow down or up, i got to figure that out because I always start with the part that's going to go up, the piece that's going to touch the earring finding. And I wrap that around and I always make sure that there's a space here. You don't want to put your spirals, your, your curls too tight because um, you want to be able to see this gradient. And if you put them too tight, you're not going to get that beautiful gradient that the background will show that, that your uh, spiral is transitioning into another color. And it looks really pretty when you leave that space.
I'm going to take a piece of copying paper, just regular old classic copying paper, and I am going to, let me back this out so you can see, make a fan. So I'm going to line this up right here. Right there, and I'm just going to fold this across. And then I'm going to fold it back on itself. And don't get your paper, don't get a paper cut doing this. And I'm going to make sure that it's semi even across, does not need to be perfect. And again, I'm going to fold it back on itself. So, so far, this is what I have. And I'm going to fold it back on itself, just like this. End to end. And I'm going to keep doing this until I go all the way across. With, sorry, I bumped you guys. It folds across here. All right. So, now that I have these folds, I can take my knitting needle and put this in here and fold it up just like this and put this on the tile with my necklace and not worry about these uh, touching anything else or sticking to anything else. Um, Kato does tend to stick to paper, so I have not tried this with Kato. Uh, typically with Kato, I'd probably use like a wax paper maybe uh, so that it wouldn't stick. And I don't know uh, particularly uh, with Fimo if Fimo sticks to paper, but I know Primo does not, and that's why I love it. So I always use a copying paper for that. So I'm going to set this off. So I'm going to set this off to the side here. And I'm going to get another knitting needle. Uh, also, if you guys have um, metal straws like this, this is a nice long metal straw. All right, so for this one, I'm going to make these really tight spirals just to kind of show you that um, you can make them tight, but just don't make them so tight that you can't see through the, the breaks in them. See, there's still plenty of space between the spirals to notice the other side. Look at that. That little bit of scrap led to all these spiral earrings. And I will fold this up and place it on the tile. And I'll place this. Since I have a little bit of a larger oven, I don't have to do these separately. I can do these together. So I'm going to be putting these both in the oven for uh, 45 minutes at 275. Uh, make sure that your collar is adhered to the curve of your plate, that it's not sticking up or anything because once it's cooked, that's the shape it's uh, gonna particularly have. Uh, don't worry about up here, this little spot right here, because that kind of simulates a collarbone anyway, and that's the way we want the um, this to hang. It's a collar style necklace, so. Uh, I will see you after this is all baked and ready to put our findings on to finish up. Okay, so now what we're going to do is measure the piece that goes from here to here. Now, I forgot to tell you guys, if you have any of these um, little twist 
it's like a twist necklace. It's it's a wire necklace, memory wire necklace. Um, these are come pre pre coated. Uh, but anyway, I forgot to tell you guys, if you wanted to use this, if you have any of these on hand, they're super um, easy to use, uh, you would just put your holes at the top of the collar on both of them and just loop it around, I'll use a large uh, connector and then just put it on there. So instead of doing that, I'm going to use the more invisible wire, which this stuff right here. So this is the stuff I get at Walmart. Now, if you do decide to use this, you will be needing crimping beads. I always get these, uh, I think they're two millimeter crimping beads that I use. So, and we're gonna worry about the uh, earrings later, but you will be needing a, uh, a hand drill or some type of drill that you like to use for those later. So we'll worry about that in the, after we're done with this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is add my, my cute little moonstone here. There we go. So now I just need to finish this. So what I did was clipped my beading wire and I clipped off more than I need. And I did five inches, which will be the front connector of the collar. I'm gonna move this out of the way because I'm not using that. And then for this right here, I did eight inches. Now typically when I make these collars, uh, the wider this area is, the less wide, uh, the less amount that I will need on the back end. Um, now if you want to be able to expand this for customers, uh, say that um, you want it to be a collar necklace but you have somebody who needs a, a wider ratio than my skinny neck, and I'm making this specifically for my neck, so you'll see how much of this wire that I actually use is not as much as you think it's going to be. Uh, but if you're making it wider, I recommend not using the magnetic clasps. Uh, I instead recommend attaching two lobster claws. That way, if they need to expand it in any way, all they have to do or all you have to do is add a chain and voila you already have your expanded uh, your ability to expand the necklace right on the spot for them. So that's what I do as well for my collars because you never truly know exactly how much um, diameter that you're gonna need in order for them to be happy. So that's why I always carry, um, when I'm at markets, I carry extra chain with me uh, and I always bring my, my tools just in case. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start on the front of the collar because that will give me an idea of how much on the back that I will need. And you can also decide if you want the Madden, you can have these clasps on the front end, honestly, and just have two tassels right here and nothing but beaded wire here, or you can use a chain or a rope, uh, whatever you wanna use on the back end and just have the, the front end uh, connected so that's you can do that as well but I'm gonna do this on the back end so I'm gonna put this through my hole and of course I made a bigger hole than I actually needed because I was honestly thinking I'll use my normal chain which is uh, I always used metal gallery and I always wait for this stuff to go on sale I never pay $16 I only pay 50 when it's 50% off I am there Oop, just knock that over Okay, so I'm going to put my uh, crimping bead on my wire because it's giving me a little trouble trying to do it with the wire already on the necklace. Feed this through and then put that, bead, that crimping bead right back in just like this. 
Now, I don't particularly like this right here, that wire showing. So I'm going to add beads. And since I have yellow as my lead off here, I'm going to use yellow to kind of cover that up. So this is how it looks. The beading wire went around and fed right back in. And now I'm going to make sure that crimping bead is, or the, the wire is nice and taut because I don't want the, any of the yellow beads to separate. And then I will just simply squeeze the crimping bead and it's on there. Now I will begin adding beads on here. And really all I need is an inch in between. So you can see I used a lot of wire here, but I'm, I don't want more than an inch between my collar so that my little danglies here don't go wobbling around too much. Exactly an inch. Now I am going to feed on my crimping bead first before, before, come on, I add my yellow beads. Now I want there to be same exact. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Yep, that's eight. Eight. Now I will feed it through my collar and you can see how much is here that I have to actually cut off. So I'm going to, first I want to feed it through here. I'm going to loosen it up so that I can feed it just through that metal crimping bead and I'm going to feed it through the white seed beads until I can't no more. Now I do need to cut some of this off. Okay, so I'm going to very carefully get my crimping bead and feed it into Okay, now I'm pulling the yellow beads. Now this is a little tricky, and like I said, if you don't want to bother with the beads, I uh, can't blame you. But I really do like when I bead my necklaces. They look cute. Now, if you notice, I have two little bits poking out here, so I'm going to snip that off and hopefully get that other bead back on to cover that. And this one, I'm going to have to cut a little bit more off. Oh, not, don't want to cut that one off. Okay, so I'm pulling it through and I'm tightening everything by pulling that end right there. And now I'm going to snip this. You might want to crush your crimping bead before you snip your little wire there. And there we go. Voila. Now I'm going to do the same thing on the back end. Now these green seed beads are the different beast. They typically do not allow me to feed um, my wire in double, you know, so looping it back around and feeding it back in. It's 
two, three, four. Oh, and I, after I'm done putting the crimping on this, that's when I'm going to measure my neck just to make sure that everything matches with my diameter. I'm gonna feed it through, bring it right back in, if I can, right into that seed bead. Perfect. And that does work. So I'm going to take my pliers and tighten Hold, I like to hold the wires and then pull on the beads really tight and then I leave my finger right there and then that's where I'm going to crimp it. And make sure that when you crimp it, if you're using uh, the same crimping beads I am, I like to make it flat this way. Because if I were to crimp it up this way, which is straight up and down, they're going to feel that little crimping bead constantly on their neck. So you want that to lay nice and flat. So now I'm gonna take this whole thing and I'm gonna go around my neck and just measure how much wire I actually need. So since I know that I'm gonna need the, all of the wire, I'm gonna go ahead and put the crimping bead on the other side. And the reason I'm doing this is I will be able to better gauge this as uh, exactly half and half, so the clasp ending ending in the middle. All right, so my bead, my crimping bead, my eight beads, and then I take this all the way around and I don't put it through the green beads. I'm just putting it through that little crimping bead. Then I usually take my pliers and I grab that loose and I tighten this as tight as I can get it and then uh, squeeze my crimping bead. Now, this is all together. So the best thing I can do to make this half is pull directly down and make sure that I'm pulling, let me get to a better angle so you guys can see what I'm doing here. I need my clippers, I'm gonna move these over. And I'm going to grab this in the middle and I'm going to put my finger at the top just like this. I'm not uh, holding it down, I'm just putting my finger here and I'm pulling that so that until, and I'm lining this up, I'm, I'm moving my finger back and forth until I get it exactly where I see that it's lined up the most even. Perfect. Now I take my finger and I hold that middle spot right up here. I'll grab these wires before I let go and I keep kind of tugging a little bit and that way I have that perfect loop to put my clippers in and clip it. And I have two crimping beads. Oh, looks like I used the other ones. So I need one more crimping bead. And again, the same thing. I'm going to use the, uh, let's see, I used green. So let's go back to blue. And what I'm going to do is I want to actually, no, I think I'll just start with blue. And this little pinky space worth of wire is perfect. So I'm going to put my crimping bead on. I'm going to take these, which are the needle news, and I'm going to flip it around and feed it right back in to 
into the crimping bead and into those white. And I'm going to leave just a little loop here. I'm pulling on the end that's feeding all the way on this side and then the short end is in the beads. So what I'm doing is I'm tugging on that side of the wire to make this nice and taut. And then I lay it down to make sure this is the side that's going to lay flat on my neck. And that's where I crimp it, right there. So now I'm going to do the same thing on this side and come back to you guys. All right, so I've got both of these sides done. I have checked it around my neck and it fits perfectly. So now all I have to do is add my jump rings for my, um, my magnetic clasp onto the ends. And the reason I'm using a cutter instead of two pliers is because for some reason when I use my cutter I am able to grab it a bit, bit better. I don't slip it, make it slip as often. I'm just weird like that. And as long as I don't clip these and pull them, push them hard, there's uh, no uh, decent lines or any scrapes on the the jump ring. So I use uh, six millimeter jump rings. I use the heavy gauge jump rings on these. And now to add my tassels. So I don't want to bang this out on the tile too much, but that is how I'm going to make my necklace on me and how it looks. So now on to our earrings. Here they are, all protected. I left one of them in uh, the toaster oven uh, because uh, it kind of rolled off the paper and I just forgot to grab it. But I only need uh, one of these to show you guys exactly what I do. I go about that far in because that's uh, where my uh, six millimeter jump ring will go in. And I put a little indent in there with my drill. And then once I put that indent in there, I can start drilling. at it just to make sure that I got it all the way through. Now if you want to hang something on the ba bottom of your spiral you can do that too just by drilling another hole. But now that I have that one uh, drilled almost all the way through I'm going to just it separates off of the metal straw really easy and I just twist it until it comes off cleanly. And then I can see that hole very clearly. I put my hand on the front end and just clean up that hole on the back end. <sighs> just like that. And I'm gonna do that to the next one. I like to start out my drilling on the straw, unless you're using a skinny needle. And then if you are, this is what you would do. You'd take it off and you would put it against your finger and drill real slowly so that you don't drill into your finger. You can do it this way as well, but I find that you don't want to put too much pressure on this, even if they're super bendy. So I always try to put my finger behind it to support it. So from here, I put on my jump rings, there we go, and I hold it right there at the opening. Take another pair of pliers or whatever you prefer to use. I'm using needle nose just because I can't find my other pair of flat wires and I'm using my... I don't typically falter on this, so I don't need my clippers to hold it. And you bend it sideways. 
add your jump ring. Add whatever earring finding that you are going to use. And fold it back. And voila. So stinking simple that if you don't make some of these, you're crazy because I always sell these. These are always a great seller. I always wear them too because they're so cute. I love rainbows, so. Oh. And you can make these in any color you want. You can make them Christmas colors. You can just all kinds of stuff. Okay, so there we go. If you spent a day just making a rainbow sheet and cutting strips, you're going to get, even if you do all the findings, all the cooking, you can do them all in one day. And I guarantee you can get 25, 30 pairs of spiral earrings done no time. And just carry some around in your pocket and just, you know, give them out with your business card. So, okay. So, that is the, that is it. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take some pictures so you guys can better see everything and show you how it looks on me as well. I definitely want to make one where there's a bunch of tassels but not quite as long, maybe this long or maybe an angle or maybe like that. So um, there's all kinds of ways that you can do this. But this is the paint splatter or paint drip necklace and spiral earrings just as a bonus for you to add with your scraps. Just make yourself some earrings. So I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. This has been a tutorial by Jen Sewell with A Grateful Studio. Please like my Facebook page. And also, if you love learning, come on over to my Facebook page. I have a Facebook group. Uh, we are almost 400 strong and every Thursday, uh, almost every Thursday, I do a live class showing uh, just various tutorials, things that I've learned, things that I'd like to share with you. Uh, and I always try to share something new and unique as best I can. And uh, just head over there, ask to join the group, and uh, I always have giveaways and fun things for you guys to do, including monthly challenges. Uh, the August monthly challenge, which is this month, is uh, the theme is art. So this would definitely be in the art category. All you do is make something art related, take a picture of it, submit it with the hashtag, and then uh, you will be entered into a uh, basically like a raffle. So, uh, and then you can choose your prize because there is a prize book for you to choose from to choose exactly what prize you prefer. So again, thank you for watching and I hope you guys have a lovely day. Bye-bye.